Today's video has to do with the heat treatment of steels. The best way to start off would be to give a general description of what a heat treatment is. Well, heat treatments consist of heating up a steel, often to a very high temperature, and cooling the steel down at a specific rate. Heat treatments affect steel's properties. Not all of them, but some of them. Most notably, heat treatments can change a steel's hardness, its resistance to wear, its resistance to shock, its malleability, and its tensile strength. There are many types of heat treatments, but seeing that this is just an introduction to heat treatments, I'm only going to present the three most popular types. The first heat treatment we're going to look at is hardening, often also called quenching. Now, hardening is a heat treatment that is used to, and hold on to your seats, it's used to harden steel. The second heat treatment we're going to look at is tempering. Tempering reduces the stresses and strains in a part that has already been hardened. Tempering imparts toughness to a steel and it reduces the chances of cracking in a hardened steel. The third heat treatment we're going to look at is annealing. And annealing is the stop rewind button of the heat treatment world. Annealing is used to take away the hardness of a quenched part. In other words, it's used to soften a hardened steel. Now before we go any further with the explanations on heat treatments, I think it would be the right time to look at the Metcalf experiment. We're now ready to do the Metcalf experiment. The Metcalf experiment is used to determine the precise color the steel should have when we quench it to get maximum hardness and the best grain structure. Now, what we're going to do is heat this steel or tool steel piece up to different levels. Now, I sectioned with grooves to get four different segments of the same bar. The first segment we're going to heat up to a bright orange, almost white. That should be way too hot for quenching. The second segment will be heated to a nice orange color. The third segment, dark orange. And the fourth segment, to a reddish color. Somewhere in there we should have the proper quenching temperature. Once I've got those colors, I'm going to quench in water quickly the part. Then we're going to clean it up, we're going to go on the lathe and just polish it because it's going to be easier to polish it when it's all in one piece. Then we're going to go to the bench and break the four segments off to observe the grain structure and the hardness that we've got at each level. Okay, the piece has been polished up and we're ready to break it into its segments. But before we break it, we should take a few moments to look at hardness just quickly and a way to determine it. And that's using a file. Now what we're going to do here, just as a demonstration, is use the edge of a file and give a certain number of strokes to each of the segments that we've produced. Now, this isn't going to cut very well when the part gets hard, so we should start from the softest end, or what should be the softest end, and work towards the number one segment. Try and put an even pressure and the same amount of strokes on each part so we can compare the results, 
Obviously, the end that's going to be the least affected by the file is going to be the hardest one. So what did we realize? The shank of the part was not hardened at all. The fourth segment filed but just barely. The third, second, and first segment are all approximately the same hardness. This is an important indication about heat treatment. We're now ready to break the different segments, so let's do that. First segment, very easy to break. Second segment. Third segment, took a lot more force to break it. Now this fourth segment should be quite difficult to break. sections apart by using a file to compare hardness. Uh, the fourth piece was the first one that was a little less hard and the shank wasn't hard at all. So pieces one, two, and three were clearly in the critical temperature range for hardening steel. The next thing we noticed was that section one and two were very easy to break off. Section one even easier than section two. But the section three became quite difficult to break, and section four was almost impossible to break off. What does that tell us? Knowing that section one, two, and three are the same hardness, but that the steel is not as tough or difficult to break the higher you go. Remember section one was very hot. Section two was too hot. Section 3 was about at the right area. So this tells us that even though they're the same hardness, the temperature that you quench steel at has an effect on how tough it is. Actually, the hotter a steel is in its critical temperature range, the larger the grains of the steel get and the easier it is to fracture that steel. We also notice the grain structure of the different segments. If we look at the grain structure of the first segment, we notice that it's quite coarse. The second segment, a little less coarse. Even though it was easy to break, the grain structure is getting a little tighter. The third section has a very tight and smooth grain. It is actually the segment that has the best heat treatment in it. It is as hard as segment two and one, but it has a grain structure that will give it maximum toughness with its maximum hardness. The fourth segment has a very coarse grain structure as well, in certain ways comparable to the first one. But in the fourth one's case, it's because it wasn't heated enough 
The fourth segment really has deformation marks in its brakes. That means that it's not really hard. It, it may be hardened in certain areas, but it was not hot enough to get a full hardness right through the part. Uh, that means that we rather tore it off than broke it off. That's why it was so difficult to break. So in conclusion, we can say that for the tool steel bar that we have here, a dark orange color was really the best color for quenching and hardening this tool steel. Uh, we saw that a light orange or even a very light orange created a piece that was just as hard but very brittle. And a dark red color just wasn't hot enough to really get this quenched and hardened. So, dark orange. You'll notice that from one steel to the next, depending on the alloy you're using, these temperatures can fluctuate somewhat, but not very much, surprisingly little actually. So, shoot for that dark orange and you'll do okay. The Metcalf experiment provides us with important information about hardened steels. But that experiment does not explain very much about how steels do harden. What happens inside steel that makes it harder after quenching than it was before? Perlite, decalescence point, critical temperature range, austenite, recalescence point, and martensite. These terms are important for understanding what happens to steel when it is hardened. So let's take a look at each one of those terms in a little more detail, starting with perlite. Perlite is the name given to steels that have not yet been hardened and that are situated at temperatures below the decalescence and recalescence points. Many people will often say that perlite steel is steel in its normal state. If you place a thermometer in a container of water and place that container of water on a heating element, turn the heating element on and you will notice that, and I think everyone already knows this, the water's temperature is going to rise. Well that's a bit of a no-brainer, but what's less well known is that if you verify the water's temperature every few seconds as it heats up over time you will notice that at a certain point just before it starts to boil the water's temperature will stop rising and will level off. That is the decalescence point. The decalescence point in this example is where the water wants to pass from a liquid to a gas. So as it's heating up, it hits that point and stabilizes its temperature, even though the heating element is still providing excessive amounts of heat. It levels off instead of heating up because it needs to absorb the energy that it requires to reorganize its molecules so that it can go from a liquid to a gas. That reorganization requires a lot of energy. So it gets its energy from the heating element and cannot, while it's doing that, continue to heat up. Steel does something similar. In its solid state, steel has phases. So if we heat up steel from room temperature perlite up to its decalescence point where it will stable off, steel will reorganize its molecules to change from perlite to austenite. Austenite is the name given to steel at temperatures superior to the decalescence and recalescence point and inferior to the top of the critical range. It is also important to note that austenite is non-magnetic. So to summarize we can say that steel within its critical range is called austenite. And that beckons the question what is the critical range? The critical temperature range is a range of temperatures within which, if quenched, steel will harden and produce a usable grain structure.
that grain structure will vary from dense and tight at the high end of the critical range to quite coarse at the lower end. The critical range of temperatures starts just above the decalescence point and goes up to an arbitrarily chosen point above which the grain structure is just not usable. If we remember our Metcalf experiment we performed earlier, we saw that sections 1, 2, and 3 were equally hard, but that sections 1 and 2 presented a very coarse grain structure. This coarse grain structure made for sections that were excessively easy to break, so very brittle and fragile. Now the sections 1 and 2 of that experiment were clearly above the critical range of temperatures. And the third section, the one that had the nice grain structure, well it was in the lower half of the critical temperature range. So as we saw in the Metcalf experiment, we're looking for a dark orange or a cherry red color. That'll give us our best grain structure because those colors are towards the bottom end of the critical temperature range. I'd love to say that it's over, but it isn't. We haven't quenched anything yet. We started with perlite, which we heated up to its decalescence point, after which it became austenite within its critical range. Now that we're in the critical range, I have two options. Either I let the steel cool down slowly, or I quench it rapidly. If I choose to let the steel cool down slowly, well it will gradually cool down, stabilize and pass through its recalescence point, after which it will return to its original state of perlite. If however I decide to quench the steel to cool it down rapidly, well I'm going to play a trick on nature. The trick here is to cool down the austenite quickly, preventing it from passing through its recalescence point. This will give us a room temperature steel that has a totally different molecular structure. This type of structure is called martensite. If we look at it as a graph, we can see that as the steel warms up and it hits 1330 degrees, it stabilizes. That is the decalescence point for most steels. Now anything above the decalescence point right up to that 1600 degrees, well all that area is in the critical range. Now if we can say that most steels a critical range starts at the decalescence point around 1330 degrees Fahrenheit, well we can't say as much for the upper limit of that critical range because we have to realize that less carbon means higher temperatures in the critical range. So the less carbon a steel contains, the higher the upper limit of the critical range. Now as we've already mentioned, if we quench a piece of steel anywhere in its critical range, well it will harden. But to get the best grain structure, the smoothest and the tightest grain, well you'll want to quench your steel towards the upper limit of that critical range. Now if we look at the graph, we can notice that if we let the piece cool down slowly after it's reached its maximum temperature, well it will cool down until it reaches its recalescence point, at which point it will stabilize off and rechange its structure to become perlite as it was before it reached its decalescence point. Now steel in its critical range is called austenite and if I quench austenite and cool it down quickly I will have quenched and hardened my steel. Now hardened steel is called martensite. If I take my martensite and heat it up to a temperature well below the lower temperature of its critical range around 600 degrees Fahrenheit and then let it cool off slowly I will have produced tempered martensite. Tempered martensite is martensite that has had its strains and stresses reduced. If we run through it one more time quickly,
We start with perlite, which is the normal state of steel, and then heat it up to its decalescence point. After the decalescence point, we call it austenite, which is the name given to steel within its critical range. When the steel is in its critical range, I can do one of two things. Let it cool down slowly and pass through its recalescence point, which will produce perlite just as we had at the very beginning, or quench it and cool it down rapidly, which will produce martensite, which is hardened steel. Martensite is very stressed, so I want to temper it to alleviate or reduce those stresses. And I heat it up, cool it down slowly, and produce tempered martensite. Martensite is hardened steel. Martensite is hard, yes, but it's also a little unstable, prone to deformation, and prone to cracking, because it's very stressed. Well, to relieve that stress somewhat, we usually perform a tempering operation. Tempering martensite is quite simple. You slowly heat the part up to a temperature well below the critical range, and then let it cool down slowly. Sounds simple, but it isn't that simple, because time and temperature play a big role in the tempering process. As far as the time goes, I would recommend about 40-45 minutes per inch of thickness of part once it has reached its temperature. That means that the more massive the part is, the longer it should stay in the oven. As for the tempering temperature, well that's a little more complex. So let's go on over to our heat treatment room to find out how color can help us determine if our part has been properly tempered. We're here in the heat treatment room to do a little experimentation on tempering color. Now we can tell the degree of temper that we're imparting to a part by the color that the steel develops in the oven. In order to demonstrate the different tempering colors of steel, I've inserted into the oven five pieces of tool steel. Now these pieces have been identified with specific temperatures stamped on the top of each part. It is quite important to note that these pieces were cleaned and polished thoroughly beforehand. Any dirt, oil that are on these parts will change the color that we're going to get at the end. So it's important that they be extremely clean. Now I've inserted the parts into the oven and I'm going to retrieve them from the oven using a pair of clean pliers. You don't want any oil, even from your fingers, touching these parts. And obviously, at 450 degrees, which is our starting temperature, you don't want to take them out with your fingers. I pulled the first piece out after 40 minutes at 450 degrees. Then, I turned the furnace up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit and I waited another half hour. So our second piece should be ready to be pulled out. So let's do that now. And now we can turn up the furnace to 530 degrees Fahrenheit for the third piece. For the fourth piece, we're going to turn the oven up to 560 degrees Fahrenheit. And now we can turn the furnace up to 610 degrees for the last piece. There you go. Five pieces, identical at the start. Five different tempering temperatures. Five different colors. So let's get these parts over to the surface plate. Get them on a white background so we can really see their proper colors. <laughs> 
and at the same time try and explain what these tempering colors mean as far as depth of temper goes. What do we notice when we look at the parts after we've heated them up to different temperatures? Well, the first thing we notice that the temperature affects its color. Now that's very important because the colors we've produced here are the colors that we use when we temper a part. Tempering a part gives toughness to a steel. A steel that has been hardened but that has not been tempered is not very resistant to shock. If you want a steel to become tougher, you have to perform a tempering operation. Now, if you want just a light temper, you're going to look for our first example, 450 degrees, and it should become just a light, pale yellow color. Something that's a little tougher, well, 500 degrees and a brownish tint would be what you're looking for. If you're into the purple zone, 530 degrees, the steel will be even a little tougher. 560 degrees gives us a steel that is quite tough, and it is usually the normal tempering uh, temperature for most operations. Finally, 620 degrees will give you a very tough steel. Now that toughness comes at a price. Every time you increase the tempering temperature, you decrease the part's hardness by a little bit. At 450 degrees, the hardness of the part is hardly not affected. However, at 620 degrees, you're approaching what we call a full temper, and you're going to lose about 30% of your hardness. So it's a give and take. The main thing that we notice is that the colors are closely tied to specific temperatures. Then this is true for most steels. I just want to warn you, depending on the alloy you're using, these colors can vary slightly, but not very much. So as a general rule, a good temper would be a nice dark blue. A light temper, a light brown, or a very light yellow and a full temper would be a light blue or a dull gray because this temperature scheme can continue. After the light blue we get even lighter blue then the piece becomes a dull gray just before it starts to be in the incandescent area of a dark red and then obviously orange, bright orange and white just before it starts to melt. So by looking at colors, looking at temperatures, you can really learn how to maximize your results with heat treatment. Well, we've just seen that tempering reduces marginally a part's hardness, but removes a lot of its stresses and strains. But what if we want to remove all the hardness from a piece of steel? If we want to remove all the hardness from a piece of steel, we will anneal it. Now, if you've been paying attention, you already have a pretty good idea of what you have to do to soften a hardened part. Annealing consists of heating up tempered martensite, or just martensite, to a temperature at the very top, or just slightly above the critical range of temperatures. We're talking here about a very bright orange. And then letting it cool down slowly. This slow cooling down permits the martensite that was heated up to an austenite to cool down slowly and pass through its recalescence point, returning to its perlite state. But not just any perlite state, a perlite state on Valium because this steel is very smooth. Why on Valium? Well, because I've removed at the same time as I annealed the part all the stresses and strains that it contained. So the part is very calm and quiet. Now I said we'd only look at three types of heat treatments for steels, but we're going to look at a fourth one very quickly because it's easy to tag on to what we've just done. If you anneal a piece of steel 
it's because you're working on a piece of steel that has been hardened by quenching. But if you want to perform something like an annealing process on a piece of steel that hasn't been hardened by quenching, but that has been strained and stressed by mechanical work, well, you're going to do about the same operation of heating it up and cooling it down slowly. But that operation will be called normalizing. So if you are annealing a part that hasn't been hardened just to increase its machinability, well, we call that a normalizing heat treatment. Well, that summarizes pretty well what I wanted to cover as far as heat treatments go. But now I think we should take a few minutes, go over to the heat treatment room, and take a look at what hardening, tempering, quenching, and all that looks like. Hey, hey, hey.